All right, let's pick up the thread here, if we can. We were at the end of chapter four of seminar 16 with this bit about the subject, which cannot be universalized in its relation to the other. Check out the passage at the bottom of page 17 of chapter four. It starts about, I don't know, 10 or so lines up from the bottom with the sentence, this demonstrates. This demonstrates that the subject, in whatever way it intends to be subsumed, either from a first position of the big other as including itself, or in the big other by limiting itself to the elements that are not elements of themselves. So these are the two logics of the big other that he's been messing with here. And we want to know how the subject factors in or not to these big others, depending on the logics that they implement. And then he asks, he says, this implies something and asks what? What does this imply? How are we going to express this exteriority in which I posited for you the signifier of the subset, namely S2? This means very precisely that the subject in the last analysis cannot be universalized. And you know what this means. To universalize something is to turn it into one, to unify it, if you will. And the subject he's telling us, as a result of what we've seen in chapter four, we now know that it cannot be universalized. There is no proposition that says in any way even in the form of the fact that the signifier is not an element of itself, that what this defines is an encompassing definition with respect to the subject. And then we come to that final sentence we were just looking at. And this also demonstrates not that the subject is not included in the field of the other, but that what can be the point where it is signified as subject is a point, let us say, outside the other, outside the universe of discourse. Let's see if we can make heads or tails of this, particularly in light of the diagram that we generated out of four, where you have these progressively encompassing rectangles and the formations of new S2s that try to encompass things that otherwise fall out. But in order to do that, let's back up a second. Let's zoom out, take stock of what we have here. At this point in seminar 16, we have a hypothesis, a topology, four algebraic symbols, and a new diagram one of several new diagrams, but our latest new diagram is the one I'm talking about, where we took those encompassing circles from chapter four and re-diagrammed those as encompassing rectangles of the topology in question here. The hypothesis we know from 60s Lacan all throughout, throughout that whole decade basically, is that the signifier is what represents a subject for another signifier. That's the hypothesis we're working with here. And the topology that accompanies this hypothesis, notice how we move from a statement that contains words to one that is going to be topologically rendered at the level of a table or a diagram, and then from there into algebra. You hear what I'm doing here? We're moving progressively through discourse towards an utterance without words. Our hypothesis is clear. The topology that it generates is also clear. You see it as a rudimentary form of the master's discourse, as it would pop in seminar 17, where you have S1 over the barred subject addressing with a little arrow pointing to S2. The signifier S1 is what represents the subject, that barred S underneath, for another signifier, here represented as S2. Which brings us to our four symbols. You've heard three. There's S1, there's S2, and there's barred subject. Also though, at this stage in 16, Lacan is giving us a new way of understanding objet a. Not exactly new, I should say, but one that is 
shows little a being used as an index for the repetitive circuit that gets started by this topology, the repetitive circuit that we saw in our last diagram, a progressively encompassing versions of the same topology. <laughs> and that's also what we want to try and make some better sense of here. So let's start with these algebraic terms and see if we can define them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bunch of things to these algebraic terms some things that we may want to cut out later, but that for now we can allow some resonance, conceptual, clinical, and otherwise, to occur between these concepts. Let's start with that S2. What do we know about S2? It's knowledge. It's deeply connected to the big other. It functions in very much the same way. It's a discourse. And in each sense, whether we're talking about knowledge, the big other, the symbolic, discourse, Lacan sees these at this point as totalizing structures. They are operationalizing a certain type of count and progressive encompassment. Each of them is operating in this way. And this, of course, connects to what he's doing when he says the big other doesn't exist. Because this totalized count, this complete count, is always incomplete. We've talked a lot about that. The point here is that S2 is always necessarily logically, structurally incomplete, barred, lacking, and as such desirous. It is always a barred other. Um, what is it desirous of? What does the big other want? Totality, universalization, absolute containment. But there's a dilemma here. If the big other, capital A, exists as, a, as an absolute container, it must be included among its contents. But if it is included among its contents, it doesn't exist as A, namely as an absolute container. So this is Lacan's version of Russell's paradox at the register of the big other, here being applied also to S2. If the totalizing count of the big other exists, then it also is an entity that has to be included in that totalizing count. But if it is included in another set, another count, it cannot be the absolute container of all sets, of all counts. That's the logic here. S1. I think S1 is the most elusive concept, the most elusive of these algebraic symbols that we have right now in 16. Here are some things that it means. S1, as I'm sure you've heard, designates the master signifier. It also represents the subject. We heard this in our hypothesis. We've seen this in our topology. S1 is what represents the subject for another signifier. Let's add something more here. If you check out the upper left quadrant of the graph of desire, I would suggest that we might make some productive headway, conceptually speaking, here by identifying S1 with the capital S signifier that signifies a lack in the big other. It's what's missing from the big other. It's what's missing from S2. And in that sense, I would suggest that we should also understand what the earlier Lacan meant by the phallic signifier or the symbolic phallus here at the level of S1. Not to say we want to keep that identification forever, 
but that there is a conceptual resonance there that I think could be mobilized for new productive thinking in the field of Lacanian psychoanalysis. You've also heard me more or less identify S1 with the no of the father, with the paternal function in its first moment. In this sense, you can also identify S1 as the unary trait, the oneary trait. Um, there's also this point that I've been making, just glancingly, that it's somehow connected to primary repression. Lacan makes a turn in this regard by shifting from his discussion of S2 as knowledge to this issue of primary repression. And I think we could make some headway here by throwing S1 in the mix as well. I wonder to what extent we could establish a relationship between S1 and the minus V of castration. I wonder how that might articulate or not. Maybe even with a non-relation that proves just as useful as any sort of an identification between the two. Now you can see what I'm doing here is I'm trying to generate some friction and connection between other concepts and notions in Lacan's thought that I think could be productively used here. Third element in our algebraic collection of four, the barred subject, this S with a line through it. The barred subject here, the split subject, if you will, is a remainder of the disjunction between saying and speaking. In brief, the grammatical and the enunciating parts of selves. The split subject is a fallout from that disjunction between the grammatical subject and the enunciating subject. It is a real effect of our dependence on the symbolic. And that's partly what Lacan is suggesting here in chapter 4 of 16 when he talks about the real getting stuck on the subject. <clears throat> we rely on language. We use language. The subject is always an effect dependent on what Lacan says in chapter 4 as the assertion. Think of that as language use. The subject is an effect of using language. And what we're suggesting here is when we read it as a disjunction, as a fallout from language use, what we see is some sort of opportunity structure for a connection with the real. Because what else is the real but a remainder of the disjunction between elements that are knowable and unknowable, sensical and nonsensical, and you can go on fleshing out the dichotomies of Western thought. The real is what falls out from those various dichotomies. It's what's left of the disjunctions that constitute the various discourses of Western thought as they rely on these dichotomies. <clears throat> the subject is also something that falls out from a dichotomy. What's continually dropping out from grammatical subjectivity is the body, a corporal scrap, a pound of flesh. It's biomateriality. There's always a biomaterial leftover that the signifier at the level of grammatical subjectivity can't quite capture. When I use the vertical pronoun I, whatever follows that, is always going to leave something behind. A part of me, always corporal, I would add, always bioanimalistic, that is not accounted for, which in turn provokes additional signifiers, additional significations, additional grammatical instances of the vertical pronoun I. The subject, as these instances repeat, as they reiterate, as I reiterate, the subject becomes an infinite 
non-identical repetition of itself. And this is what Lacan means at the end of chapter 4 when he says you cannot universalize the subject. You can't make it one because its relation to itself is repetitive and differential. The subject is always a repetition with a difference. And those differences prevent any sort of universalization of the subject. I'm never going to be able to just say, I once, and finally, once and for all, tell you what it's about. The subject doesn't work that way. Which brings us to this fourth algebraic symbol, little a. What is little a? Lacan tells us in 16 that it's an index or a symbol of this repetitive, ever-expanding circuit in which S2 has to be expanded to incorporate an S1, but that that incorporation always leaves something behind. And that something behind is a split subject that then provokes a new master signifier, an S1, to try and encompass what the previous iteration left behind. But that encompassment, in turn, also leaves a remainder, which in turn provokes another S1, and another expansion of S2, and so on and so forth. The algebraic symbol for this repetitive necessity, a logical repetition that just keeps going, that we see on display in the diagram we were working with, is little a. Go back, look at the diagram, you'll see what I mean. So here it is in sum. S2 is always lacking. S1 signifies not just a subject, it signifies what is lacking in S2. S2 then tries to encompass this S1 because holy shit, if I'm the totality, totality of signifiers and there's this other signifier out here representing a subject to me, damn it, I better get my hands on that one too. I better swell to encompass that signifier in addition to all the ones I already have collected here in my S2. S2 tries to encompass each and every S1 that pops up. But here's the deal. This progressive encompassment always leaves something behind that in turn provokes a new S1. We're trying to drill down on the repetitive necessity that is at stake here. You've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. Repetition is the central concept in Lacan's thought right now, here in 16. The subject, where we started this little discussion, the subject is what is repeatedly dropped out from this process, provoking a new S1, to encompass the subject that was left out. And that in turn provokes a new expansion of the S2 to encompass that S1. And little a is just the signifier, index is the term Lacan uses here. Symbol maybe works a little bit better, but it's a symbol of this three part, three element circuit of S1, S2, and the barred subject. That doesn't just occur once. The topology is a great place to start, but when you actually introduce logical, structural movement into that topology, what you see is that it reiterates. It forces a kind of repetition of itself, an expansion of itself. And this expansion doesn't just mark the production of the barred subject as a repetition of itself that is non-identical, that is not universalizable. This progressive expansion, it also shows us the desire of the big other. 
In our last series, we learned that the big other lacks. One of the things that's popping up here now in seminar 16 is that this lack structural, logical, necessary in the big other, not unlike the lack inherent in every subject, in turn becomes a cause of desire. And the desire of the big other, again, is absolute containment. If the big other lacks, if it is desirous, what is the object of its desire? We've talked a lot about what is effectively the cause of the big other's desire, the structural necessary breakdowns that define its operativity. Okay, what exactly is the object of the big other's desire? Chapter five gives us a clue. First page. Lacan talks about taking a little note for everybody that he wants to bring to the conversation. I can understand that. Notice the end of the first paragraph. A certain number of references, he says he started to say, that are absolutely essential for maintaining the I in quotation marks in a sufficient light, sufficient for it not to be able to thrown, to be thrown, um, Jeter, but also remember that um, it's from the Latin jacere, meaning to throw, so it's closely related here. There is a J or an I uh, in that, to be thrown to the dogs, namely professors. So he's giving us a clue as to what it is that is the object, not the object cause, but the object of the big other's desire. This I in quotation marks that we usually use to symbolize the grammatical subject, that part of me that appears in and as language whenever I use the vertical pronoun I, the indexer I that always shifts depending on who's using it. If you use I, it's now yours. If I use it, it's mine. It shifts around. But here, it's the vertical pronoun I as a signifier that interests Lacan. And what he wants to do is figure out a way to keep it in sufficient light, sufficient for it, this vertical pronoun I, to not be thrown to the dogs, namely me, the professors. I love this. It's a great place to start. Um, and then he goes on and starts getting into the Hebrew. I am what I is. He's toying with it, admitting that it's not his strong suit, at least at the level of pronunciation. And then a few pages in, we're on page three, he gives us another hint. For us, in an approach that can be opened up, it is before the big other. You see this paragraph on page three? As allowing a logical failing to be circumscribed, as locus of an original flaw, brought to bear on the word insofar as it might respond that the I, as firstly subjected, and notice his play on words here, I wrote somewhere to designate this subject insofar as in discourse, it is never produced except as divided. So on the one hand, there's a really simple statement here that because we are only able to appear in language as signifiers, we're always torn between our sociolinguistic status at the level of language and our bioanimalistic status at the level of embodiment. Now, there's a more complex point here, though, because what's at stake seems to be circumscribing the logical failure at the center of the big other, an original flaw brought to bear on the word insofar as it might respond that the I, here's that I in quotation marks again, appears as firstly subjected. This is our first clue. I, vertical pronoun, as grammatical subject. And I would like to suggest also as a kind of S1 in the topology that we've been working with. It's the signifier that represents the subject for, to, another signifier. And it's operating at the level of assertion. It's operating at the level of language use. 
and the subject is an effect of this language use. The subject does not precede the vertical pronoun. It is a product of that pronoun's usage. Moving on here, page four, pretty fun stuff, big other, thou, and then right back to I again. Page five is interesting here because it's on page five that he returns to this notion of S2 that reminds us that however much we want to connect S2 to the big other, they are not exactly the same. S2 is a subset of the big other. And he emphasizes this in chapter four. We didn't spend much time on it, but it's there. They are akin, but S2 is fundamentally a subset, which is a word he starts using here. And here what he's adding on five is that S2 is an extracted subset, a subset outside the big other. So he says, take a sheet of paper and write down on that sheet of paper all the totality of signifiers. Um, he says at the bottom of page four, a totality of signifiers, you can write them all on the page if you reduce them to phonemes. And suddenly you've got a page that is effectively the big other. This is, this is his example. This is what counts as an illustration. You have a page, you write all the totality of signifiers and at the level of phonemes, and pow, you got the big other. Now, where's S2 on this? He's going to say that shit is off the page. Notice, this other signifier, S2, will be outside the page. And you can see the diagram on five with him working this. Big other is the big circle, you might say, and there's that little S2 that is being extracted. It's a subset, but not sub in the... It's, an, it's a different kind of set that is extracted, that is outside the big other. Um, sub, if we allow it the same way that we refer to the subject. Um, let's see what else we can make of this. We're moving on to page six, and we see this connection between grammatical subject and S1. Notice this, because I really want you to have some passages in mind when you're thinking about whether you want to accept the connection between the grammatical subject I and the, um, the S1 that we've been talking about here. Right about middle of the page, end of that top paragraph, beginning of the next one. This grammatical subject then, so difficult to properly circumscribe, is only the place where something comes to be represented. Now we know that the subject is the something that comes to be represented in the level of grammar, in the level of language. It's the bio-animalistic part of the subject that gets left out, but there's always some part of that that gets signified and represented at the level of language use, at the level of sociolinguistics. The example that we had from our last lecture was one of my cat's names, Lucifer and how that shifts from Lucifer to Mittens and so on and so forth, and why that happens. Here you can just think of the grammatical subject as Lucifer. It's the signifier we use to represent her. But that signifier doesn't capture all that she's about, you see, and so you can recall where we were last time. Now notice the move immediately after this on page six. Let us come back to this S1. In so far as it is what represents this something, so the same something on display connected to a grammatical subject is now attached to S1. And let us recall that when the last time we wanted to extract this S2 from the field of the other, there's that emphasis on S2 as a subset that's been extracted from the big other. As appeared necessary because it could not maintain itself in it, you can read chapter four to figure out how he's thinking his way through that, that reasoning in order to collect together the S alpha, S beta, S gamma, in which we claim to grasp this subject. So here's a clear statement of S2 as an extracted subset connected to the subject pulled from the big other, and also a connection between S1, the grammatical subject, the vertical pronoun, I, and the split subject that these things represent. Moving on, 
there's some pretty good stuff at the bottom of six about the subject being outside the big other again. But then he gets right back once more on seven to the big other as lacking, as barred, and about how math tries to cover this up. This failure, though, is unavoidable. At the top of page eight, we start getting some good stuff here. Lacan's going to say that completeness is lacking. And as a result, what we wind up with are points of undecidability. Terrific use of term here, really happy that he's got this in here. And you could go a long way working with this notion of the undecidable that is a function or an opportunity structure that's opened up by the fact that completeness is lacking, as he says at the top of page eight. For us, though, what's really terrific is where he goes next. In the paragraph that begins these echelons, let's take a close and careful look at this paragraph. These echelons, not of uncertainty, but of defect in the logical texture, are the very ones that may allow us to grasp that the subject as such might, in a way, find there his support, his status. In a word, the reference then at the level of stating is satisfied by adhering to the fault itself. Now this is kind of interesting, given the type of stickiness and adherence that we saw in chapter four, which was Lacan saying that the real gets stuck on the subject for reasons we've discussed. Now he's saying that the subject is itself adhering to something else. The subject is also in turn stuck to something else. What is it stuck to? The subject is stuck to the defect in the logical texture of the big other. The lack in the big other is the defect or the fault to which the subject is attached, adhering, and so forth. The split subject, the barred subject, whatever we mean by this, Lacan is here telling us in 16, is adherent to stuck to, glommed on to the defect or the fault in the big other, in the symbolic, if you want to even go that far. Isn't this, wouldn't this make sense and be another reason why the real would also be stuck to the subject? What else is the real but a fault line in the symbolic? <clears throat> Reading on. Does it not seem to you that just as perhaps on condition that such a numerous audience would be so obliging as perhaps we can make it felt in some construction, even if it entails, as I already did in connection with the field of the big other, abbreviating it, it may be in a way rendered necessary in the statement of discourse that they can be... Okay, what the hell? Just skip the sentence. Now, some of you may all, oh, how could you do that? How could you just skip a sentence? This is the best sentence in the whole chapter. All right, cool. Let's talk about it. But I want to go somewhere else. Because in tackling this field from the outside, from logic, nothing prevents us, it appears, from forging the signifier by which there is connoted what is wanting in the signifying articulation itself. Here he is talking about the signifier of the barred other. Again, that upper left-hand quadrant of the graph of desire. What is the signifier that connotes what is wanting or lacking in the signifying articulation itself, qua big other, qua symbolic, if that's easier. We're looking for the signifier of the lack in the other. If this something could, and I am still leaving this in the margin, be articulated, and this has been done, that proves that this signifier is with the signifier with which a subject in the final analysis can be satisfied by identifying himself to it as identical and the very lack of discourse cannot be situated. Now this is one of those sentences where it's tempting to let go of it, but this is one we actually want to keep a hold of. Let's see if we can read it without a lot of the interjections that Lacan offers. If this something, namely the signifier of the lack in the other, could be articulated, that proves that this signifier with which a subject 
can be satisfied by identifying himself with it as identical to the very lack of discourse cannot be situated. That last part is key, right? The signifier of the lack in the other that the subject is identified with, stuck to, adhering to, this S1, if you will, can't be situated. And then he goes on to say, of course, if you will allow me here, this abbreviated formula, and not all of those here who are analysts not aware that it is for want of any exploration of this order that the notion of castration, whoa, and then he's at minus phi. And this is one of the ways where we can start seeing how the subject identifies with the S1, and the S1 is the signifier of the bar and the other, and this is also hooked into the minus V of castration. So you have right now this cluster of algebraic terms, key terms, you might even say, in Lacanian psychoanalysis. And it's great when you've got these clusters. Things are all popping here together. And we'll see which terms we want to keep, which ones we want to shunt to the side. But for right now, note this move. The signifier of the lack in the other is connected to the S1 that represents the subject for another signifier here, S2. And all of this is analogous to, he says at the bottom of page 8, castration. This notion of castration, which is indeed what I hope you have sensed in passing to be analogous, analogous to what I am saying. That the notion of castration remains so vague, so uncertain, and then he goes on. But castration is somehow caught up in this as well. This notion of identification between the subject and the signifier of the lack and the other is an interesting one. And the fact that it cannot be situated makes it even more interesting. Why can't it be situated? Is it because relative to the big other, this minus V, this S1, if you want to link those two up, and again, we're playing with this stuff. Is it because this is a sight and a signal of non-being, of something that relative to the symbolics count of everything is in fact a nothing, a no thing, which is part and parcel of how we get to the minus phi of castration. Castration marks the production and proliferation of no things, things that are prohibited, becoming lost objects, but more importantly for us, resulting in openings, a limited number of mouths on the human body that are also erogenous. But we're moving fast. Good stuff on the next page. Page 9 has more on S2 as something outside the big other. And then on page 10, I don't know about you, but my brain starts to hurt on page 10 in the best way. He starts getting back to the drive. It is therefore, first of all, insofar as the other is not consistent. So he's now just assuming that everybody is on board and totally understands that the other doesn't exist. The other as consistent, as complete, as whole doesn't exist. Something's always missing from it. And what we're talking about right now is the something that is missing from the big other's count and accounting of everything. And we're getting some new ways to think about this as a signifier and as a subject. And then he gets into stating, turning into demand, which gives us bearing in the graph of desire to what he defines in his math theme of the drive. That's what you see about in the middle of page 10. And then he's got a little rendering of the graph of desire down below to help support the statements and conclusions he wants to get at. Now, move up from that graph about six lines from the very fact of the structure of the other 
Now remember, when he says, from the very fact of the structure of the other, remember, he is again assuming that we all know and can see logically, structurally, why the other is inconsistent. And from the basis of the structure, certain things follow. From the very fact of the structure of the other, all stating, whatever it may be, becomes demand. Demand of what this other is lacking. At the level of this barred subject relative to the big D of demand, the double question is, I ask myself what you desire. And it's double, which is precisely the question we are highlighting today. You remember where we started, the opening page of chapter five, the very question that we are asking today that is stemming from a little note that Lacan wrote to himself. I ask you, not who I am, but further again, what I is. Now here, because of the way this is written, you can tell that the I in question is not some sense of self, it is a figure of self. What does the vertical pronoun I mean? What is it? What is this vertical pronoun? The vertical pronoun I as an S1. Hell, we might even rewrite the S1 as an SI is the object of the other's desire. And then he goes on. On page 11, we're back at the desire of the other and then right back to the question of the I. Notice this last riff, the top paragraph on page 11. What you desire, namely what you are lacking, linked to the fact that I am subjected to you. This is a great dilemma to think through. What are you lacking relative to the fact that I am subjected to you? Now you can think of this like that section in Seminar 11 that we talked a lot about in previous series, where Lacan is working through the outer limits of separation, the logic of separation that would have a self-mortifying contour, where the child might ask the parent, could you lose me? Could you be lacking me? Could I be the thing that you're missing? Here, what is new and I think really profound is this bit about relative to the fact that I am subjected to you. Could I be a figure of your lack? And how does that impact the fact that I am dependent on you, subjected to you? It's a pretty interesting move. But again, we're after that vertical pronoun, so we're going to stay laser focused on this, which is where he turns in the very next sentence. And on the other hand, I ask you what I is, the status of the I as such. You can hear me going past mustard pots on page 12, which extend to page 13. Still good stuff on the mustard pot and very much in keeping with the idea that things are always leaking away and leaking out of these cracked cups, these hold pots and so forth. For us though, the goods start on page 14. We pick up the thread on page 14. The paragraph that begins the meaning as product. Drop down about five lines. What we are seeking is what not from the other, but outside the other as such, suspends what is articulated from the other, the S2 as outside the field. That's kind of an odd sentence, and at the risk of putting too fine a point on it, as we're often want to do, let's give it a whirl. What we are seeking is what not from the other, which is where we get S2. S2 is a subset extracted from the big other, but something outside the other as such. Is this the subject? Is this S1? 
but he's marking some sort of a difference, something that's been cleaved from the other and something that is outside the other as such. Not as an extracted subset, but as an ultra set, an ultra entity, something beyond the big other as such. And it's what this thing does, suspending what is articulated from the other, this S2. It suspends the S2. This is a great passage for us to consider and one to look forward to when the standard English translation of 16 becomes available. <clears throat> Here is the question of knowing what is involved in the subject. So we're not talking about S2, we're talking about S1, particularly as it relates to the subject. And whether this subject cannot in any way be grasped by discourse, here also is the justification for what can be substituted for it. This is the final page of chapter 5 of seminar 16. And so far what we have is a jumble, several jumbles, of terms and of concepts. I think chapter 5 is terrific because it starts showing us how these terms cluster and cling together and gives us a sense of their relationship, further specifying S2's relationship to the big other and further specifying S1 and all of its imbricated relations to other important elements in Lacan's algebra. Where we go from here, we'll see when we get into the next chapter.